Talks. I'm Nikki Rishon Scholl, and Nikki Talks is a series of conversations with people on Cape Ann who are interesting people, lead interesting lives, and have a lot to say about our environment. So today, I am very fortunate to have Brenda Malloy, who is the proprietress of the Imagine Shop on Rocky Neck. Welcome, Brenda. Thank you. Um, so I always start with a few questions about um, how you ended up in Gloucester, you know, how long you've been here, just what your, your path was to, to being here on Cape Ann. Well, I have the good fortune of having been here since I was in utero <laughs> and uh, started coming here the um, first summer I was born as a summer resident. My family lived about an hour away and my grandfather had bought a cottage on the Anasquam. So I was there every summer of my life up through the end of college pretty much. Oh, nice. And then moved here full time in 96 when I was, um, I had been traveling around the country in my van for about three and a half years and I said to myself, well, where would I like to settle down? And I couldn't think of any place other than Gloucester. Yeah, yeah, good choice. Yeah, hard I to love find any place better than Gloucester, as far as I'm concerned. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah, we're all a little Gloucester centric, but so tell me about the three and a half years traveling around the country. Were you by yourself, or uh, I had a big white German Shepherd with me, <laughs> and I had been lead, leaving, leading a pretty traditional life up to that point, and literally woke up one morning and decided that I wanted to try something different, and I thought I would travel around the country for six months but it actually ended up being um, most of three and a half years. Wow. Um, and why, did, why was it so much longer? I mean, was it, did you find places where you wanted to stay for an extended period of time? Or? Uh, I was just really enjoying myself. I yeah, liked the yeah. unstructured life. I yeah. liked um, being able to go where I wanted, when I wanted. Most of the time I was in either the Midwest or the West Coast in the drier climates. Huh. And I would just sleep outside on the ground. I never stayed in a campground in all that time, not once. Um, wow. And I would take odd jobs here and there when I needed income. But yep. pretty much I just lived as um, simply as I could. And I would spend my days walking and talking to people and, yeah. and learning a lot about just the human story. Yeah, yeah. and and. Um, it's like the opposite of glamping, so thing that quite <laughs> yeah. through my mind, sleeping on the ground. And, and where would you say, I'm sure it's not just one answer, but you know, that in those travels that you, you felt like the most engaged and most, you know, connected in, in the places where you traveled? I think I really enjoyed being on the beaches in Baja, Cali Baja um, California, in yeah. Mexico. Yeah. On the East Coast, on the Sea of Cortez, and mm. just being able to hang out there. And they mm. had, I was in a place where they had a huge sandbar that was the shape of Cape Cod, but quite a bit smaller, obviously. And there was nobody else on the beach, and I oh, just stayed there for like a couple paradise. of weeks. Yeah, it was really, really quite beautiful there. And you spent a lot of time by yourself, even as you were engaging with other people, I'd imagine. Oh, yeah. I love hanging out with me. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I have a good time yeah. with myself. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. You know, it's especially great for women, I think, because, um, you know, a lot of women go from, you know, family to spouse, and they never get to do anything like that. Yeah. Like, they never get to live alone, let alone travel across the country for three and a half years. Yeah, That's yeah. That's pretty great. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. There were times that I would say to myself, geez, I wish I had somebody with me, whether it was a partner or yeah. a friend or a family member, because there were so many beautiful, really it's, wonderful yeah, experiences. Yeah. But I I, I just yeah. journaled a lot and, yep. and you know, kind of expressed myself that way. Yeah. And so, and then you just kind of came to a place where you said, okay, got this. Now I want to kind of plant. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when I was thinking of places that I would like to, you know, quote unquote, settle down, Gloucester was the only place I could think of. Yeah. So I came back here. Yeah, and you had all that in utero experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so tell me about Rocky Neck, because I know you're a big part of the Rocky Neck community. And just tell me a little bit about it. I mean, I'm all the way over in Lanesville. so you know, <laughs> The other side of the world. That's right. Some people have never been, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I wasn't really that familiar with Rocky Neck. Um, mm -hmm. I had certainly been to a couple of the restaurants down there over right. the years, but right. had never walked the full length of Rocky Neck or spent any time going in any of the galleries yeah. and I happened to have taken my little, I had a little inflatable boat and took it to Sailor Stands for breakfast one day and went for a long walk around the coastline of Rocky Neck. 
mm -hmm. and walked by what is now my Imagine Gallery. And there was a, a, win, a sign in the front window that said Gallery Studio Space for Rent 2002 Season. Oh. And the whole building just kind of hummed to me. And I went next door into John Nesta's gallery, looked out the back and saw his view. And then he came into the room and I said, wow, I can't imagine living here having this view. And he said, well, you can do it. And by the end of that day, I had rented the space. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great story. Yeah. The, you know, there's sometimes that moment that, that you say, okay, this is, this is where I need to be. This yeah. is it. And then you can make it happen somehow. Yeah, it, yeah, serendipity. Yeah, serendipity, serendipity. And so when was that? That was 2002. Okay. Yeah, well, 2002 was my first season, so this was fall okay. of 2001. Okay. And, and so I know there was, I should know more about this, but there was that building right near you that went in. Oh, d um, oh, yeah, uh, I'm forgetting the name of was it. it. Was the, it? The, the wharf. Um, yeah, the wharf? West Wharf. West Wharf. Yeah, that happened oh, that before right I got there. Oh, that was before you got there. Yeah, and that was further down the road. Oh, down, it was? Okay, down, I thought it was Down right across there. from the Mad Fish. Oh, 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 it was. Oh, okay, I thought it was right there. But that, I, from what I understand, was a pretty big blow to Rocky Neck because they I lost so. a lot of accommodations and a lot of yeah, artists lived there yeah. and painted there. Yeah. Yeah, that so was that a was a huge deal. loss. Yep, yep. For sure. And um, so the name of the gallery is Imagine. Yes. And why is it called that? Uh, well, when I was first starting the establishment, I was thinking the name Imagination. And I called a girlfriend of mine to say, what do you think about Imagination? And she said, how about Imagine? And I said, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. it. Yeah, active. Yeah. So it's actually the sign um, that I painted says Imagine, and then there's a heart and peace sign underneath it because I just believe if you can imagine love and peace, you can have love and peace. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's just kind of what I try to embody mm -hmm. as I go through my days. Yep. Yeah. And so what's in there? Well, in there I, and around there. When I first opened, I wasn't an artist. I didn't paint at all. And I had been spending a couple of winters over in Asia. So I decided to bring um, crafts back from artisans over there. I was in Thailand. I'd go there and spend five months in Thailand and Nepal and some winters Bali or India, and mm. so I was bringing other people's handicrafts back, and I sold other, maybe 25 other artists' work on consignment from Gloucester. A local artist. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then um, after I was there for three years, or four years, I started painting myself, mm -hmm. and after that started dedicating one wall of the shop to my own work, and each year I'd add a wall of my own work, mm -hmm. and stopped carrying other artists' work, and huh. so now it's, a little bit of the handicrafts from Asia, but mostly um, I do really colorful abstract yeah. paintings and yep. greeting cards and magnets, and I paint um, scarves and hats and yep. handbags. Right, that's the hat? Yes. So you painted that hat? Yes. Yeah, that's yeah I great. had the hat made in Thailand, and then, oh. I, then I paint it oh, on, it's great. on my front lawn. That's where I do most of my work. Yeah, I think I've seen you out there. Yeah. Yeah. And are, is it busy? It's probably busy in the summer, right? It is, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's nice because it doesn't get as packed as bearskin neck. You know, the number right. of times people have said to me, "Oh, you should be on bearskin neck; you'd make more money." But I'm kind of more into quality of life than I am money. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's sure it's it's a pretty amazing place to be. Yeah, I love and it. And so you must have seen somewhat of a evolution on Rocky Neck and and the whole sort of art colony concept of Rocky Neck. Can well, you talk about that a little? Yeah, when I first um, opened up in 2002, it was pretty much just a summer place. Right, with restaurants. The, yeah, yeah, for the artists. Yeah. And the art colony organization itself really concentrated on the, the six-month season. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And after a few years, we became more of a year-round organization. We would meet mm -hmm. year-round. Mm -hmm. And, you know, down on Mad Fish Wharf is where most of the galleries are located. Yeah. And that's gone through a lot of transition, yeah. you know, with change in ownership. Um, so right. it's 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 kind of challenging to see the changes and to wonder year to year what's going to be going on down there. Mm -hmm. But it prevails, and we end up with some amazing artists every yeah. year. Yeah, yeah. You know, we lost the Gettemans and John Nesta in the last three, right. three years, and right. that's been a big loss for and us. And they were real, like... Foundational yeah, people they, down they had there. been there for, for yeah. 30 years, yeah. so we yeah. lost a lot of gravitas. But yep. fortunately, yep. we've got some other wonderful artists that are joining us, so it's it's great. 
And the, and the whole establishment of the Rocky Neck Art Colony, like, is that what, is it called something else? No, it's just the Rocky Neck Art Colony, and I think it was five or six years ago yeah. we, we purchased the former Christian Science Church yes. on Rocky Neck. right. And that's now the cultural center. Yes. And it's av available for um, a lot of different types of uh, yeah. events people want to have there, and we have ever-changing exhibitions there. So it's really nice to have an anchor yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah. and it, feel, it feels very active there. I mean, yes, yeah, it is. Of, we have a lot of wonderful excellent. programming. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Um, so, let's see. Oh, talk, if you could talk a little bit about your traveling to, um, you know, Nepal and India and Thailand. And when did you start doing that? I mean, was it, probably wasn't just to buy for the shop, was it? No, I had started going there in March of 2000 because I felt really compelled to go to Tibet. Yeah. Um, I don't even think I actually knew where Tibet was when I just felt this calling to go there. Mm -hmm. And I had met somebody in Gloucester who suggested, well, if you're going to go to Tibet, you should really go to Nepal first and then travel overland to Tibet. Mm -hmm. So I booked a trip to go by myself and spent four months in Nepal that trip and one month in Tibet. Mm -hmm. and just really fell in love with it, um, worked really hard to get a business visa for Nepal, thought for sure I would actually live in Nepal, that oh. was my intention. Wow. And I came back here for 10 weeks at the end of that trip and went back to Asia for seven months. But on that trip I realized Kathmandu, Nepal was just too polluted for me to live there. I was like, well, I need to make a change of plan. Oh. Um, and it just was, all the way around, like the air and the... Yeah, the air quality and yeah. the water quality water. just wasn't something I wanted to subject my body to. And yeah. I felt very fortunate that I had the choice because the, oh, sure, the residents obviously. don't, don't the, have right, that. Right. Um, but I had started getting involved with um, sponsoring a boy in Nepal I had met at a coffee shop. Oh. So I a started... Young, a like a child? Yeah, or? he was yeah. seven years old. Oh. A uh, really short little guy, a little yeah. bit mal malnutritious, yeah. and he uh, he just really pulled on my heartstrings. So I started sponsoring him on my second trip, huh. and when I had come back after being there for seven months, um, I said to myself, "All right, I need to create a lifestyle that requires me to go to Asia because huh. I need to go there to administer to him directly, yeah, and keep connected to him. Yeah, and I need yeah. a reason to keep going to Nepal. Huh. Um, so." That was when I said, well, I'll just start a business that I go there and, and buy uh, merchandise. So it all kind of worked out really well. So you still go. How old is this person now? Well, it was uh, almost 20 years ago, so now he's, he's 20, 27. What's his first name? What's his name? Till. Till. Yeah, like Till tomorrow, but just it, Till. Yeah, yeah. And we, we talk on, on Skype and stay in touch. So it's really nice. And at one point, I had 14 kids there that I was sponsoring, oh. just kids that I had met when I lived in a neighborhood there. And they were kids that oh. weren't really getting a good education. And so it wasn't through an, an agency or anything. It was just your own individual identifying of these kids? Yes. Yeah. Oh. And that's why I wanted to go every year sure. to take care of their tuition and get their uniforms and all that. And I don't go annually anymore because yeah. I yeah. just missed being here for the winters and doing something different with my time. But yeah. But I, you know, I still go back. Yeah. Well, that's great. I didn't know that about the kids. Yeah. Yeah. So are you in contact with most of them? I'm in contact through Facebook yeah. with, with most of them, yeah, which is really pretty yeah, interesting. that's what Facebook is good for right there. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the kids have all graduated. I've only got three of them left that I'm still involved with. But I stay in touch with almost every single one of them through Facebook, which oh, is really fabulous. nice. Yeah, it yeah. is. It's a good way to connect. Absolutely. Especially you know, across the globe. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. pretty amazing. It totally we, is. we didn't have that when I first started there, so it's it's really fortunate yeah. that that exists. Yeah. Um, so one other thing you mentioned when we were talking um, a few days ago, whenever that was, last week, um, you said something, I think, about flight school. Yeah, well, when I was in high school, I wanted to be an airline pilot, so I went to a small private college in New Hampshire that had their own um, flight training program in their own airport, their own fleet of aircraft. Which college is that? It was called Hawthorne College. But is it, it still? No, it closed, I think it was in 88. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and I started flying fixed wing and... Which means? Airplanes. Oh, okay. And I don't know any, anything oh, yeah, about no, that kind of okay. language. Fixed and wing. 
and I realized after I got my private pilot's license that I'd be really bored flying an airliner because it just wasn't. You mean like a big passenger airliner? Yeah. Uh, I, that's what I thought I wanted to do. Because that's the idea, right? You go to flight school and you kind of yeah. make your way up to flying for Southwest or something. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I realized it wouldn't be engaging enough for me. I didn't care how good the schedule was or the money or the yeah. benefits. Yeah. It just, I lost yeah, interest. Yeah, whole system probably. Yeah, and yep. so my sophomore year, I didn't fly at all and tried to figure out what I wanted to do. And then at the end of my sophomore year, they brought a helicopter up and said, if enough people are interested in this, we'll start a helicopter program. And I tried that and found it very engaging and interesting and challenging. Huh. And so I did that commercially for 12 years. Oh, that's and, a long time. Yeah, and that's what I was doing before I started traveling in the van. Oh, okay. This little piece is clicking together in my mind. Yeah. So, so you did that from, was that your base up there in New Hampshire? Or? Well, I did it, I flew up there, finished my training. After I graduated, I stayed on as the chief uh, flight instructor for the helicopter program. Huh. And then went down to New York City and was flying for New York Helicopter and Island Helicopter. So doing airline shuttle and charter and sightseeing tours. Like, so, so to the I islands... Off. Uh, no, it just to um, Kennedy, Newark, LaGuardia oh, airports. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Huh. And and then to the different airports around the area or whatever location. And, the, and in the helicopter were people. Yeah, we had 14 passenger helicopters. And they would be like, I'm trying to get an idea. Would they be tourists coming? Would they want to see? Most of them were people who flew into Kennedy off the Concord and wanted to be okay. transported to another airport or downtown Manhattan. Huh. Uh, it was kind of included in there. Concord was that fair. fun? Oh, it was great. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah, I've been fortunate to not really do anything I didn't love. Yeah. Oh, yeah, good for you. That's not a common statement. Yeah. I would yeah. Say. That's a great thing to do. Yeah. Did you ever skydive? I did. Yeah. How surprising. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> I actually thought I'd become a jump master teaching other people how to skydive, but I ended up going off in a different direction. You did a bunch of times? No, just, just once. once. Yeah. It's Loved so funny. It. It's always it's it's one of those things that people say, you know, that's on my bucket list because yeah. people feel like, you know, when I'm 96, I'm going to jump out of a plane. And sky yeah. Dive. Well, and when I did it, you jumped out of the airplane by yourself. Now everybody does Oh, that's does usually it. a buddy or something. Yeah. yeah, now you're tandem. You're literally strapped to somebody else. And I'm grateful I did it back when you could jump out by yourself because I, I imagine there's a significant difference between doing it yourself and doing it literally strapped to another human body. What kind of difference? I think it's got to be more fun and invigorating doing it by yourself. Yeah. You know, just floating, hanging underneath the canopy, just you alone, instead of really having the jump master be the one who's having the experience and you're just kind of holding on to his back. Oh, that's how it goes? Yeah. yeah oh, you're, I thought you're it was... literally strapped. Oh, no, I didn't realize yeah. that. I thought it was some sort of a thing with a big distance between the two. No, you're oh, literally, that's you're literally, yeah. you know, oh, I just get that. a few I totally inches between what you're each other. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, doing it on your own, yeah, yeah. So do you fly at all now? I don't. Yeah. I haven't. The last time I flew was the summer of 95. I was herding reindeer up in Nome, Alaska. Oh. <laughs> so it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Was that a job? Yeah, it was. I had been um, living in the van, and my old flight instructor called me and said, hey, would you like to come up to Alaska because an Eskimo friend of mine needs a, a pilot for the summer because his pilot just backed out. So I drove from Florida up to Anchorage. I think it was about 5,000 miles. Yeah. It was a pretty significant road trip, which was fabulous. And uh, it, that was a fun job. It was By yourself you drove? Yep, me and my yeah. dog. Yeah, yeah. Not the same white German Shepherd. Same one. Oh, same one? Yeah. <laughs> Is he still around? No. No. No, no. It's too no. many years have passed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that sounds really awesome. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. It was really good. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Um, so, I mean, first of all, your, your, your life adventures seem awesome. And, you know, I guess you could maybe say that you have led an unconventional life. Would you say that? Yeah. Well, I think I, think I was really struck um, at one point I was in Connecticut and I volunteered at a homeless shelter yeah. on Thanksgiving. Yeah. And that really kind of changed things for me. Um, Huh. I may not have been aware of it at the time, mm -hmm. but it, it really um, just, I don't know, expanded me in a way. Yeah. And when I st the, the first day that I took off in the van, my, I stopped at a Kmart to buy some music tapes 
somebody had just installed a stereo system for me in the van. And as I stood in line to buy these 10 music tapes, I stood there and I said, well, let's say each of these tapes was $10. And let's say if I went and got some job, random job, I made $10 an hour. I said, am I willing to work 10 hours to pay for these 10 videotapes? And I said, you know, I'd rather have the day off. And I put the tapes back. And ever since that moment, every single thing that I've thought that I wanted or needed, um, I said to myself, am I willing to work for this? And basically, I've come to the conclusion that I would way rather have the a time. lot of free time than I would have money in the bank. Mm -hmm. And I, I think traveling in the van really exposed me to um, people's journeys and yep. their priorities and yep. what makes people feel good and happy. And living in a really materialistic culture like we do, um, I saw that people could have everything in the world, all the money in the world, and they still weren't feeling content. And then when I opened my, sh my shop on Rocky Neck, that was when I really started to appreciate that people were discontent and weren't very happy because people would say to me, you're driving that junky old car out front and you live in this teeny tiny living space behind your shop and you're happy with that? And I'm like, yeah, I am. And I would hear that from people a lot. And people would say to me, oh, I've got you know, a, a beautiful wife or a handsome husband and I've got wonderful kids and I've got this house and that boat and this car and I'm not that happy. Like, how can you be happy with nothing? And I'm like, because this stuff has nothing to do with it. Although, of course, having your needs for. The children and for. the partner, maybe, but not the goods. Yeah, well, and seeing that a lot of people were in unhealthy relationships. Yeah, <clears throat> yep. You know, <throat> and, and the facade of looking like yes. one is happy and successful. I think that's one of the greatest burdens that people bear is yeah. that the burden of pretense. And basically, like, you know, pasting the smile on and kind of saying, I'm great, when there's just unbelievable turmoil. Yeah, and, and people really strain. caring what others think. I, I think a I was lot. blessed with, yeah. with really not caring what people think. Not that I go through the world looking to, um, you know. Annoy people? Yeah, <laughs> not at all. Yeah. But I, what others think isn't, it isn't really relevant. It's interesting. Yeah. I always, because I, I, you know, when I talk to my clients, or just to myself for that matter, and my friends, I think about the two sort of what I call kind of like the emotional, psychological, and behavioral epidemics, you know, in our culture. And one of them is, is that. It's like, well, I can't do that because this is what they're going to think of me. Or I can't really be myself because it's going to look like this or that to those other people. Yeah. And the other one is the, the disease of comparison, I call it. Yeah. So we're all always kind of, well, you know, she, her house is, you know, a lot cleaner than my house, or her kids are so accomplished, and, you know, that yeah, kind of thing. I think it's almost like a virus. Yeah, that's what yeah, I mean. Yeah, exactly. I think, um, it's like on fire in this culture. And I think people often aren't even aware that this is inside of them. Yep, I think not. I think not. I have like 85 more questions. We have about five minutes, so let me just take a second to look. Um, I wanted to read this quote to you because I thought about you. I read it this morning, actually. So I read a book um, called The Book of Awakening. Are you familiar with that? It's Mark Nepo. No. Oh, you would love it. It's really great. I'll oh, well, check it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll send it to you. Um, but I read a quote, and I think it might actually take into consideration a lot of these other questions. Although I did want to ask you, and maybe we can get to just a little bit about because I know you're pretty active in the community, partly because I see you, you know, a lot of things. And I'm curious about what you think are some of the priorities for us, you know, for our community, for Gloucester, in terms of, you know, where we might put our energy. And I know there isn't any one single one. You know, there's, like, one of mine is that it pains me to see all those empty storefronts on Main Street because I know people are going to Amazon and they're going to the malls and oh, yeah. you know the sort of the death of the mom and pop that's one of my issues but um, yeah I'd be curious what you what you think about that well I think um, having truly affordable housing available yeah um, I think that's probably the biggest issue yeah, I mean I, I know yeah. I know people that have been looking for affordable apartments Absolutely. for years and years. are having a hard time yep I also think that it's unfortunate that Gloucester doesn't seem to appreciate what a precious gem it is as far as um, our zoning regulations mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. we just 
there seems to be this mentality that bigger is better and yeah. more is better and and these huge McMansions going yeah up huge everywhere. McMansions that are that are abandoned most of the yeah. year nobody's there except for two or three weeks a year and you know we have these monstrosities showing up on our coastline yes and it just seems like the the development is going on unabated and does, it, people does. are tearing down beautiful structures yes. you know Rocky Neck is a classic example. It it's is. a really beautiful. I'm just driving around there and seeing those very ones that we're yeah, talking about. Yeah, it's a beautiful little peninsula, it and is. people move there because they love it. And it seems the very first thing they do is knock down what was there and put up something yes. quite different. And not that the homes aren't lovely and the people in them aren't lovely, but it's just the kind of the lack of appreciation and. I find it unfortunate that for some reason we can't live in the same kind of structure people happily lived in 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. We need a great room that's three times as large and yeah. we need a room for every person who lives in the house and I, I don't know, it kind of blows my mind what how high our needs are. Yeah, yeah, they're way out of proportion. I wanted to read you this quote because we only have literally two minutes. Um, so Mark Nepo, he's a poet and philosopher. And he has lots of things to say, and it's a daily thing, so you open up to the date. And oh, I like those books. Me too. So this is today's. I offer what has surprised me in my pain. So he's somebody who lost a partner and also had cancer. That life is not fair, but unending in its capacity to change us. That compassion is fair, and feeling is just. Mm -hmm. And that we are not responsible for all that befalls us only for how we receive it and for how we hold each other up along the way. So what's your thought about that? And we'll end with that and also anything else that you feel is your, would be your message, you know, that you would want to tell people who might be watching the show. Well, I think it's a great quote and I, um, I really connect with, with what he says, especially w when he's referring to we can't control what happens to us in life, but how we respond is our responsibility. Yeah. And if people could only appreciate that, that we do have control over how we respond if we choose to do the work and the personal growth and what it takes to be able to feel good despite what's going on. Because if things have to be good in order for us to feel good, we're going to have a pretty miserable life. Yeah. Yeah, and especially lately where things are going every which way. Yeah. Yeah, I think if we can um, find peace inside no matter what's going on around us and not be at the whim of what's coming our way, that's really the, the sure way to feel good every day. Yeah, yeah. It's not easy for everybody to figure out how to do that, but it seems like you've definitely found Well, it some takes paths. a lot of work. It takes work. Yeah. Work and practice. Yeah. yeah. People would rather maybe be shopping or <laughs> doing something else other than yeah. doing the inside work. Building a McMansion or something like that. Yeah. Well, we are out of time. So thank you okay. so much. Thank Brenda. you. Thanks for being on here.